We don't have any awards and proclamations today, so we'll proceed to Citizens Forum. Citizens Forum is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak on an item that does not appear on today's agenda. Please identify yourself by your first and last name and let us know what city you're from and limit your remarks to three minutes. Thank you. Norman Manuslon, Kansas. The Jerry Ivy Park green algae issue. This was preventable. We've known about this for three years. Why didn't the responsible parties that are in charge of this prevent this? This was preventable. Thank you, Mr. Mantle. Um, just having, I, I don't want to, I don't want to like get into a whole discussion right now, but we are aware of the problem. And that's one of the reasons why we assembled a, both a, a design group to take a look at um, solution or re, a redesign of the Jerry Ivy Pond versus perhaps um, removing it. And um, I mean, it has to do with, oh, I'm sorry. Again, I'm going to reiterate, mm -hmm. that was preventable. We've known about this for a long time, this issue. And it don't take that much, it wouldn't have taken much money to have prevented it to make, take action to do something. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak this afternoon? Dalton McDowell, City of Salina. Um, I was going through some of your codes on landscaping, whatever. With the drought conditions that we've been known to have here in the last 20 years, it'd be nice if you would switch up what you require and how much you require of stuff so we can do a more drought resistant landscaping instead of your fescue grass that takes like two inches of water a week. It'd be nice if you could possibly switch some of that up so we can save some water and conserve some water. Thank you very much, Mr. McDowell. Is there anyone else who would like to speak this afternoon? Excuse me, Stan Byquist, Salina, Kansas, 2601 South Ohio. Um, I would like to commend everybody that was involved with the city and private parties for letting this lead sled event happen. It, it was wonderful. And I want to thank everybody. Mr. Byquist, I'm so glad you did. I had it to bring up under other business to thank all the the parties involved, because I know it took a lot of effort from KKOA, city staff, volunteers, and I really, really enjoy seeing all those old cars on the streets of Salina. And it was nice to see all of our businesses and restaurants packed. It was great. And I talked to many of the, the people that came here, some from as far away as California for the first time, drove their cars, and they absolutely enjoyed it. So thank everybody. Oh, great. That's so good to hear. Thank you, Mr. Byquist. Is there anyone else here today who'd like to speak? I'm Sherry Harp from Salina. And uh, as you probably know that we have completed our petition and our signatures around town for the for any overreach that the city might have. Uh, just wanna reiterate with people, we could have had a whole lot more signatures had we have uh, spent more time, but we just felt the urgency to get that done and get it in to have it checked out. And we have the 2,100 signatures plus. So take into consideration some of the things that are coming up in the future with uh, the scare of the COVID again, I think is, on TV and it's on radio and stuff that um, we're just not, there's probably a lot of flu cases and some other things that are involved here too. It can't just be COVID and just remember that people have uh, been getting their shots and we would just like the 
to be aware of the amount of people that we had come out and express their opinions of their freedoms in Salina. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Harp. And just following up on something that you said, thanks to everyone who's gotten the vaccine and we would just encourage um, um, all Salina citizens to um, take, take advantage of, of, of the opportunity because we had 85, I think, new cases in Salina last week. Um, is there anyone online who would like to speak? With that, we will proceed to the consent agenda. Item 6.1, approve the minutes of July 19, 2021. Um, is there... Does anyone want to pull the uh, minutes from the consent agenda? <laughs> and if not, I would. Mayor, I move we approve the minutes of July 19th, 2021. Second. We have a motion and a second <clears throat> to approve the minutes of July 19th, 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, item 7.1. Item 7.1. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you for raising your hand, Mr. Sprague. I even drew a line under uh, Citizens Forum, and I still didn't make it happen. Um, we have been presented with an additional item for today's meeting, and I will let Mr. Sprague um, bring everyone here up to speed on what that is. Sure. Assuming that you place it on the agenda, we can provide a staff report to give us the background. But as you know, we've been in conversation with Slina Media Connection had a conversation as late as Friday afternoon with them and, and were asked to expedite this item. So staff's done that. We ran into a technical difficulty with the, uh, the third party software that we use to send that notice out um, to our distribution list. So rather than treating this as an agenda item that staff initiated and put on your agenda prior to the meeting, um, we're presenting it to you and would, you would need to add it to the agenda as a, as a recent amendment. If you wish to take it up today, any and how would we characterize this? Um, approval. Uh, the it doesn't necessarily have to be item seven point two, but approval of the determination that Salina Media Connection has provided adequate documentation with, with regard to listed non-city funded assets. And we just say we want to add that we would like to amend the agenda to include that at this point, and then we would have the staff report. Um, correct. If you have an opinion about where you want it on the agenda right. as part of that amendment, right. you could place it on the agenda. Mayor, I move we place the item on the agenda. Yeah, second. Okay. And was that motion including as item 7.2? It's, it's yeah, where it's ordered. <laughs> no, that's you'd like to place it. That's 7.2 is fine. Um, we have a motion to add item 7.2 to today's agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Now we'll back up and we'll go to 7.1. Item 7.1, authorized publication of notice of budget hearing for the 2022 budget, which sets August 9th as the date for public hearing on the 2022 budget and establishes the maximum limits of the 2022 budget. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. Debbie Pack, Director of Finance. <clears throat> State statute requires that we hold a public hearing um, to allow citizen input on our, our budget, and we have to give 10 days notice of that public hearing. So today's action is to get, get permission from you to actually make that publication. Um, along with that, we are setting our maximum um, ad valorem tax that we can uh, levy. The, le the maximum levy that we um, have been directed from you is 30.452, which is the neutral re the revenue neutral rate that was provided by the county. Um, that revenue, that mill levy will provide about $10.8 million in taxes um, that would go into the uh, 2022 budget. The next uh, steps for the budget would be this budget hearing in the first reading of the adoption of the budget on August 9th. We'll have the second reading of the, adopt, of the ordinance for the adoption on August 16th, along with the comprehensive fees and the pay uh, classification and salary schedule. Um, once that's adopted under, second, uh, under the second reading of the ordinance, we'll submit that to the county. And then in the fall, sometime around October or November, we'll come back to you with the CIP, the sub-CIP, and the water and wastewater rates. There's no financial implication on this, um, but the request is that you authorize us pub to uh, publish these in the paper for an August 9th uh, budget hearing. 
Thank you, Ms. Pack. Any questions for staff? Any, well, thank you very much, appreciate it. Any questions or comments from the public? And I don't see any hands raised online, so I'll bring it back to the commission. Mayor Hodges, I move we authorize publication of the notice of budget hearing for the 2022 budget, which sets August 9th as the date for public hearing on the 2022 budget and establishes the maximum limit for the 2022 budget. Second. I have a motion and a second to authorize the publication of the notice of budget hearing for the 2022 budget, which sets August 9th as the date for the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes and takes us to item 7.2. Item 7.2, approve the determination that Salina Media Connection has provided adequate documentation with regard to listed non-city funded assets. Mr. Stray. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, well, Mr. Wood. Tag team, sorry. I'll turn it over to Mr. Wood, but I have late breaking <laughs> information by way of a phone call at 3.59, so I'm sure we'll be tag teaming this a bit. Well, then whoever right. wants to start, go for it. I'll go for it. Mayor Commissioners, uh, Deputy City Manager Jacob Wood. Um, this uh, item it comes kind of in response to our discussion we had last week. Uh, last week, the, the commission determined that we should send a letter to Salina Media Connection uh, that kind of outlined three things that we need to, to move forward uh, with the recently terminated agreement. Um, the first of those is a transfer of all city-funded assets from Salina Media Connection to the city. Uh, including equipment purchased with funds received from the city and all unexpended funds uh, received um, from the city. The second item is a examination of the city's legal obligation in response to SMC's delivery to the city of a list of equipment they would like to keep. And the third item um, is the city securing and utilizing the space in Memorial Hall uh, that SMC has been operating and managed their video product production <laughs> facility. Um, so that letter, uh, kind of detailing, very detailed letter, uh, eight, eight or nine pages about how we would like to move forward in that process was sent and delivered um, to uh, Salina Media Connection on the 21st, which was last Wednesday. On the 22nd, we received a letter from their legal counsel. It's included in your packet. I'm not going to go through the, the whole thing. Um, but uh, the basis was that they really wanted to set a meeting with us on Friday to kind of discuss how we would move forward with this. So we had a meeting with them. Um, to kind of go through things uh, a little bit, talk about uh, how we were going to manage their time in the facility um, and how we were going to manage. Um, they, they have some ongoing commitments that they would like to continue to, to try and fulfill. Um, and they think that they can do that with uh, some of the equipment that we provide them as part of the request that they originally sent us. Um, in your packet, you'll see uh, there's a request that they sent us a couple of weeks ago, I think around the 15th. They did provide some additional documentation uh, with that. Um, the agreement that we have with them or the, the former agreement said that um, basically all city assets or all assets over there are considered considered to be city funded unless they can provide documentation that show that they weren't purchased with city funds. And so they've done that for some things. Um, and what we're here to do tonight is to, to get your approval um, to release those that equipment. So right now they they can't take anything out of a, out of Memorial Hall. They would like to take some of that equipment out um, so that they can use it to fulfill their ongoing um, obligations. I'm going to share my screen here. This is not posted online just yet. Um, so I want everybody to see what the list looks like. And I've only got 43 things to do here. So this is a list of equipment that uh, we believe uh, they provided sufficient evidence that shows that this was um, per, that was purchased with funds that are not city funds. Uh, so there's several grants, the Earl Bain Foundation grant, um, Greater uh, Salina Community Foundation grant, uh, another grant from uh, the Department of Kansas, another, uh, some William Graves Foundation, and then another Earl Bain uh, Foundation grant. Uh, so this is just a list of all the equipment that they've said they purchased with Alpha Side funds, and they did provide documentation that shows that that's the case. So, so tonight, what we'd like you to do is to approve this list so that we can uh, check it off and allow Salina Media Connection to have that going forward. I do want to mention there's some additional equipment that was on that list. Um, there's another three grants. Uh, one was the James R. Allen Family Fund Grant at $4,800, um, Salina Regional Health Foundation Grant, and a personal donation um, that are listed there. And then there's a part of an Earl Bain Foundation where they provided a little bit of documentation, but not enough to, to show uh, this piece of equipment. So, um, so there's three items there um, that were pulling from the list that they submitted earlier, and I will go back and ask for additional um, 
clarification on those items. Um, I did want to mention that there are some items uh, that are listed here um, that are that were put into room 107 that are, that are used as part of the, the public casting. Um, so that's this this set of items here um, from the Earl Bain Foundation. This was all purchased last year and it's installed um, in this room. So that's something that we'll have to work with uh, with Slime Me Connection. It is it is purchased with outside city funds, and so it is something that we should release to them. Um, we haven't had any conversations just yet, uh, but we're we're working towards that. We'll we'll figure something out on how that works, whether we give it back to them or you know offset some funds or something like that. Um, but we'll we'll work forward um, to that in the future. There are a couple of other things that, that are still outstanding. We haven't come to an agreement on the fund balance just yet. Um, they have indicated that they're going to try and find a new location to operate out of. They'll be taking the equipment that we approve here um, and then um, any of their files and folders, that sort of thing, uh, so they can um, continue to have that uh, to, to a site um, that's not Memorial Hall. Um, not exactly sure when that's going to happen, that they indicated it could happen as early as tomorrow. So we're continuing to work forward. I think we've made some progress in the last couple of days, and this is just the next step in that process. So you have a couple of options here. Uh, you can approve uh, our de determination that SMC has provided adequate documentation to declare the listed items as non-city funded assets. Um, and then we'd also ask that you give the city manager authority to approve those uh, ongoing requests in the future so we don't have to bring everyone um, back to the city commission. I don't anticipate that they're going to be larger than the city manager's uh, purchasing authority. Um, maybe if we add them up over the time, they might be, but the, there they don't seem to be uh, real big purchases um, at this point. So with that, I would open it up to any questions. And if Mike has late breaking news, I'll let him <laughs> dig, dig into that. A couple of updates. I uh, have had conversations with their attorney today and took a call right before the meeting started. One of the questions, well, two of the questions we had for them were whether they'd figured anything out in terms of an alternate location and whether they need to be in on Tuesday. Um, they're still working on that, but they do think that they'll be physically at least packing things up, whether they take them out of the building on Tuesday or not. So I think unless you tell me otherwise, I'm going to proceed as if staff has discretion to work with them in terms of their access to the building and removal of approved equipment. Um, we will do so on a basis of uh, having a sta city staff person there to, to be in the building and coordinate that and supervise that. Um, and then also in, they indicated a willingness to a recognition that some of that equipment that was grant funded is essential to um, casting the meetings and at least a willingness to not remove that at this time. And so we can have additional conversations about uh, the value of it, whether it has value to both of us, uh, how we might sort that out. So um, there, I think we're all doing the best we can to try to work together. Um, she did share with me, um, looks like they they expect that they may be in the building the remainder of the week trying to pack things up. Um, and I honestly don't know how much more research they'll have to do in terms of documentation and how long that process might take. But um, so kind of recapping, um, we're comfortable with what, what Mr. Woods described as having been sufficiently documented to recommend that to you. I don't want to characterize the other items as necessarily denied other than then for the purpose of the agreement, we do need to communicate a response to them uh, in a timely manner. So I, I expect they are probably likely that they'll be able to find additional documentation on those other items in this staff report. I expect that there may be other um, submissions, but I think, uh, I think the focus is on grants that they've secured and equipment they've been able to purchase with it. So, um, and then we'll just have to see what we can sort out in terms of the equipment that was grant funded that's that's uh, useful for broadcasting our meetings. In the event that uh, it's needed by them, then we'll have to replace it. In the event that it's not needed by them and that we can come to some type of an agreement, we can talk about compensation or uh, some some other pieces of equipment that have value to them and not us maybe. All right, thank you very much. Any questions for staff? <laughs> So we are able to match the grants up with invoices on the pro on the pieces that were purchased. Then, as part of the yes, for, yes for for these for these ones that, that I've highlighted, it's all documentation provided by them. But they have grant award documentation combined with invoices that seem and to just match. glance and had again haven't had a chance to review that. But none of this equipment will affect our broadcasting or current meetings correct no it, some of it could the the earl the, i mean in, the in first amount that we've we're get the of the twenty nine thousand dollars worth of equipment we're giving them does any of that impact our 
Yes, it does. There, there's about eleven thousand dollars worth um, that last. The stuff that says is funded by Earl Bain Foundation grant in 2020. That is all equipment that came into this room when they upgraded the cameras and did some some different audio things. So it is all equipment that's that's in 107 right now. And then there's another piece of equipment that that they purchased from Cox. Uh, that's part of the. It's called the Peg Encoder. That that is. I think that's located across the street, but it's also something that would impact um, our our ability to cast. So, and I want to be sure to characterize it correctly. They've indicated a preliminary willingness to not remove that equipment immediately and to continue to have conversations. My intention is to discuss with them whether it has value to them and whether you know we can uh, agree on some form of compensation or equipment trade or whether we just need to replace it at our expense. Any other questions? Um, I guess I, I just had a couple. The first is, has Salina Media Connection been notified that we are requiring additional documentation for the funds from the Allen Family, Salina Regional Health Foundation, and Earl Bain Foundation grants from 2000? No, they have not. Okay. So, and because our software wasn't working, they may not have got received notice that we were going to take this up today. Or or did we yeah, have verbal conversations? They yeah. they were aware, but okay. we have, okay. haven't gone okay. into this detail. Okay. It, it was okay. at their request that we expedited the review and brought it to you. And there's a recognition on their part that you know some of this may not be approved and may require additional documentation. But we haven't gone into this level of detail with them yet. Um, do you have any sense for the length of time, and especially the amount of staff time it's going to take to complete an inventory and go through? Um, all of the equipment that, that we need to go through? Yeah, so today we conducted a video inventory uh, with them jointly with Slime Media Connection. That was part of our conversation on Friday. So we do have documentation of everything that, that they have uh, by way of video. Now we don't have, I mean, that's basically walking around the facility, pointing things out. We don't have things serial number by serial number. Um, if we were to get into that kind of detail, it's going to take a, a great deal of time. But I think the video inventory will serve our purpose uh, for, you know, we'll be able to see what's there and, and what's not. So I'm, I'm not anticipating that we'll go through it line by line unless it gets to the point where we really feel like that's necessary. Um, hopefully that's not the case, but, but but we'll do it if we have to, and it will take a significant amount of time. I mean, there's a lot I mean, of equipment. Yeah, I, what, I'm, <laughs> what I'm hoping is, I mean, we've got a lot of things that 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 could use our time and attention, and I just don't want to get you know, bogged down with determining whether a $3,500 um, camcorder can be, you know, it, it, whether it stays with them or, or with us. But yeah, um, if, if it's helpful, I think the conversation's turned to focusing on equipment that they're able to demonstrate was funded with non city okay. resources. And we're kind of zeroing in on that. What I don't know is if additional document review on their part may expand uh, that, that list of equipment. Um, not, we haven't had any indication to that effect so far that I'm aware of. And my final question is, I take it that any legal costs that they're incurring will come out of their funds that uh, will be divided between us, what, however we calculate that? Correct. Okay. Um, and we had some conversations about fund balances, but we our, our meeting was from 1 to 3.30 and we just ran out of time. <laughs> so that we agreed that's a topic that we'll need to take up further. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Any questions or comments from the public? And I don't see anyone's hand raised online, so I will bring it back to the commission for further discussion or action. And I apologize. There is one other point that um, there, there was also a question raised about personal belongings in the building. And so we talked about uh, number one, those being de minimis in terms of their value at, at 150 or, or so. And then some, if there's any concern, some affirmation, written affirmation on the part of a person that that was their personal belonging. So as we talked about discretion for myself and, and designees, um, that's something for you to deliberate on. But our, our recommendation would be um, approve what we we've, have indicated. We feel they've documented and then grant staff uh, the, the authority to uh, approve additional requests if sufficient documentation exists 
and then also make uh, discretionary determinations on personal belongings. Okay. Mayor, through the determination that SMC has provided adequate documentation to declare the listed items as non-city funded assets and give the city manager authority to approve future requests. Sir, second. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Good luck. We'll keep you informed. All right, item 8.1. Item 8.1, approve ordinance number 21-11068, changing the zoning classification of the Salina Public Library campus from C4 to PPF. Mr. Hers. Yes, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Dustin Hers with Planning and Zoning for the City of Salina. And Jacob, if you could pull up an aerial photo, we will go through some quick background on this property. The subject property that we're talking about is the library portion of the City County Civic Campus. And the background for the Civic Campus is that um, the area was originally plat platted in 1862 and it was redeveloped through a, an urban renewal project in the 1960s. And when that happened, 8th Street, which did go all the way through, was shut from Elm Street down south to Ash, and all of the houses that were along 9th Street, 8th Street, and 7th Street were demolished, and the whole site was redeveloped to what we see today, which is two building structures, one being the library to the north and the city county building, which we are in currently to the south. This property was zoned as part of a citywide comprehensive rezoning project in 1977 as C4 Central Business District, which is our downtown zoning district and has remained C4 till this day. The planning staff received in March a sign permit application for an electronic message center sign from the library. They're wanting to put up a digital sign that they could change to inform the public of different uh, resources that they have, different events and activities that they were hosting so that the people could be. As part of that review, we identified that because the library property is located in the C4 district, we weren't able to issue that sign permit because the C4 district prohibits electronic message center signs to protect the historic integrity of a lot of the downtown area. So then what happened is staff met with the library and their representatives to talk about different options. During that conversation, one of the options that came up was to potentially rezone the property to a public use district. And the history on that is in 2012, the Planning Commission and City Commission worked together to create a, plant, a public use district that would have the intent and purpose of designing and creating a, a district that would accommodate public uses such as government facilities, police stations, uh, fire stations, and the like. In 2014, just to the north of the library, fire station number one was rezoned to a, a public use district. And so in that conversation with the uh, library and their representatives, the conversation went, well, we are part of a, a greater campus here. We have a, a city county civic center campus. What about the south portion? And so what happened is planning staff, along with the library and their representatives, attended a board, uh, a, the building authority board of directors meeting, talked about the potential of rezoning the property and the board of directors voted to, uh, in the future, rezone the property. Now that is a application that we are yet to receive. And so this is an independent rezoning uh, request for just the north portion, just the library's portion of, of the campus. So that's the history of, of where we are. The public use district is a district, as I mentioned, that is designed for uh, public type facilities. And not to say that when the Planning Commission and City Commission were creating that district that they were thinking specifically of this property, but they were thinking of properties like this. The thing that is different or the main things that are different between the C4 Central Business District and Public Use District is that the Central Business District has zero lot line requirements in terms of building setbacks, where you have buildings that can... Uh, 
can um, take up the entire lot. There are zero setbacks. They have a lot, 100% lot coverage. You don't have off-street parking requirements. You don't have landscaping requirements. The public use district is different in that it does require off-street parking. It does require building setbacks and it does require uh, landscaping. And so what we did is we actually went and looked at the existing site that we have for the public library and compared it to the requirements of the public use district just to confirm that we weren't creating any nonconformities with a potential rezoning case. And it does, the, the site does meet all of the public use district minimum requirements. Looking at the suitability of the site under the existing zoning, the C4 district is more of a downtown urban style zoning district, which doesn't really fit the development pattern of the campus. The campus is probably more aligned with the public use district and those requirements thereof. Libraries are permitted in the public use district and EMC signs, electronic message center signs with changeable copy are also allowed in the public use district. So if you were to approve this rezoning request, that would enable the library to potentially uh, obtain a building or sign permit for that proposed sign. The way that the library functions or, or has functioned in the last 50 years would not change with a rezoning request. It would still re remain in the public library. And so none of that would change. The character of the neighborhood, uh, we have public uses all around the campus. In the public library to the west, we have the Salina Senior Center, which is a public use. To the east, we have the Saline County Health Department. To the north, we have the fire station. And to the south, which is where we are currently located, we have the City County Building, which are all public type facilities. Uh, public utilities and services would not be, uh, there would be no proposed changes. There are nothing that would be required to be changed as everything would function as it has. The same with streets and access. The property that is the library portion has 97 off street parking spaces, which has proved to be sufficient historically, and they have adequate access off of Elm. None of that would change. The future land use plan actually looked forward to this property being a public use. And so if you look at the future land use plan, you will see that it is part of the public, semi public land use category in the comprehensive plan. In July, uh, on July 6 of 2021, the Planning Commission voted 5-0 to recommend approval with the findings that you'll find on page nine of your staff report and also within the attached ordinance. The action items or the options that the commission may have is one, the commission could concur with the recommendation of the Planning Commission and approve the ordinance uh, changing the zoning classification of this property from C4 Central Business District to the Public Use Public Facilities District on first reading. Option two is the City Commission could refer this application back to the Planning Commission for reconsideration, stating that the reasons for its uh, disagreement with the Planning Commission's recommendation. Number three, the City Commission could direct the applicant to resubmit this application as a plan development district which would require the applicant to submit a site plan for the commission's review and give the commission the opportunity to approve a more restrictive list of permitted uses than what the public use public facilities district would allow. This would result in this item going back to the planning commission. And last option number four, the city commission could overturn the recommendation of the planning commission and decide that the zoning classification of the subject property should remain in place and make a motion that ordinance uh, number 21-11068, changing the zoning classification of the property uh, not be approved. This would require form of affirmative votes. If this option were chosen, the property would be limited to the uses and limitations allowed in the C4 district. This would include the continued prohibition of the proposed electronic message center sign. So staff would take any questions that we have. And I believe we do have a representative of the library here if you have questions for them. Thank you, Mr. Hers. Any questions for Mr. Hers or for the Salina Public Library? Oh, How right. is that parcel determined? I guess I always thought that the, the campus was divided in half. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't speak to that history. Um, I do know that when the urban renewal project originally took place, the parties were 
Saline County, the city of Salina, and then USD 305, who also had their administrative offices here originally. I don't have the history of how, how the library was, was dissected or, or split off from the rest of the Civic Center campus. We're sure there's that 97 parking stall that's, <laughs> that's right there. <laughs> right, right. Thank you very much, Mr. Sure. Uh, I would mention just as, as a note that's completely unrelated, but for anyone that's paying attention that, that would like to know, um, the Planning Commission is having a study session with the Tree Advisory Board on August 3rd to talk about our recommended zero escape planting list, which are plants that are, are tolerant to um, drought conditions as well as our, our, our soil types and, and climate zones. So for anyone that is interested in those landscaping conversations, we are having one coming up. Okay, and that's with the Tree Advisory Board? On it's August. actually going to be the, the, planning, the planning Commission, commission. And, okay. and members of the, the um, Tree Advisory Board on August 3rd. Great. And we plan to have some out, outside representatives from um, K-State and, and other people that uh, align themselves with doing research on, on knowing things about plants. So, <laughs> Thank you very much. Otherwise known as horticulture. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the public? I don't see any online either, so I will bring this back to the commission. Mayor Hodges, I move that the Salina City Commission concur with the recommendation of the Planning Commission and approve ordinance number 21-11068, changing the zoning classification of this property from C4 Central Business to PPF Public Use Public Facilities District on first reading. Second. We have a motion and a second, lots of seconds, to approve ordinance number 21-11068 on first reading. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you very much. And we'll have the second reading of that on next week. And then the library can proceed with their with their sign. Item 8.2. Item 8.2, approve ordinance number 21-11067, changing the zoning classification of Kansas Wesleyan University from R3, C3 centered and PC5 to U district. The rezoning request area consists of four lots on the north side of Claflin Avenue. Mr. Ander. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, these are two companion items, items 8.2 and 8.3. With your indulgence, I'm gonna address 8.2 first, um, which is kind of the big picture part of this. And so item 8.2 deals with the future land use map. Kansas Wesleyan has submitted two applications together. The first one is requesting that the future land use map for the city of Salina be amended. Um, to show this property on the north side of Claflin between Highland and North, South Ninth Street as public and semi-public instead of the current urban residential and neighborhood center. And that is uh, because that classification more accurately reflects their ownership and planned use of the property. It also reflects their proposal to expand their campus east of Highland Avenue towards uh, South Ninth Street. So. As far as the land use map goes, um, the role of the city commission is, in this case, is to decide what its vision is for the future development on the north side of Claflin Avenue between Ninth Street and Highland. The question is really whether you believe that it's more closely related to the Ninth and Cloud Neighborhood Center extending north, or if you think it's more closely related to the Claflin Avenue corridor extending west from the heart of the Kansas Wesleyan campus. The Planning Commission met on July the 6th, and they felt that this property um, was more closely related to the Kansas Wesleyan campus to the east, and they approved a motion to recommend that the future land use map be amended to show this property as public, semi-public, instead of as urban residential and as part of a neighborhood center. And so that 
on item 8.3 comes to you with a recommendation uh, to approve a land use map amendment. And your options would be to concur with the findings and recommendations of the Planning Commission and approve Ordinance 211066, amending the future land use designation for this property on the north side of Claflin. You could also refer this application back to the Planning Commission for reconsideration, stating the reasons for your disagreement with the Planning Commission's recommendation, or you could overturn the recommendation of the Planning Commission and decide that the future land use of this property should remain in place as urban residential and neighborhood center. If you reaffirm that boundary, that action alone would not prevent Kansas Wesley from converting the building to an art school or constructing the parking lot, but it would indicate a lack of support for Kansas Wesleyan's companion application to rezone this property to a university district. So with that, I would address any questions about the future land use map. The, the four properties that are subject to the land use map amendment are identical to the four properties that they're requesting to rezone. I think my only question is, um, are we then going to deal with item 8.3, the land map um, aspect first and then come back to item 8.2? I think we might've just gotten them flip-flopped. Yeah, in I, th I think from the terms of the order of the agenda, the reason that the ordinance number was 11066 was anticipation of that being considered first before the zoning request. So it would, from that standpoint, it would make sense to make a determination about the future land use and then move to the zoning question, if that works. Procedurally, do we need to um, do anything to, because we had announced item 8.2 and the city clerk had read that into the record. So. I don't know if the city attorney has an opinion. If someone were ever looking at the minutes years later, it might be confusing. If you wanted to make a motion to amend and reverse this order, that would probably better put it on record. Okay. And well, and I don't want to presuppose anyone's vote here, but is there any problem with going ahead and um, addressing ordinance number 21, or addressing the um, zoning classification change first and then um, doing the future land use map designation in the order that was printed in the agenda? I mean, could we have the um, the staff report on item 8.3 and then just take them in the order that they were presented here? Would it be cleaner if I just move to reverse the order on our agenda of 8.2 and 8.3? Is there a second? Motion and a second to reverse the order, putting 8.3 before 8.2. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So we'll deal with 8.3 first. Any questions for staff? I would just note that in your packet, um, in addition to the land use map, there's a map that shows the properties that have been acquired by Kansas Wesleyan University, and, and they have continued to acquire additional properties between Highland and South 9th Street, which are reflected on that that map. Thank you. Any questions for staff on the um, future land use designation? No. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew. Any questions or comments from the public regarding the future land use designation? I don't see anyone online, so I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion or action. Mayor, move approval of ordinance number 21-11066, amending the future land use designation of property located on the north side of Claflin Avenue between South 9th Street and Highland Avenue from urban residential and neighborhood center to public, semi-public. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 21-11066. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion passes. Now we'll go ahead and deal with item 8.2, the zoning classification change. 
now that we've looked at the, the big picture and the future vision, this application deals with what the zoning classification should be for four lots on the north side of Claflin between 9th and Highland. And we have properties addressed as 1512 Highland, which formerly was the site of a single family dwelling, 1518 Highland, also the site of a, a single family dwelling that's been removed, 212 West Claflin, also the site of a single family dwelling that's been removed. And then there's a former service station building that's at the corner of 9th and Claflin. And the request is to rezone these properties to University District consistent with the rest of the Kansas Wesleyan campus. And the plan for these properties is to convert the building uh, that was the former service station to a building for the Kansas Wesleyan Arts Department. And then there is a plan uh, to construct a surface parking lot at the northwest corner of Highland and Claflin. And uh, the zoning request is to allow those the conversion of the property to those two uses. What you don't see in the packet is that um, earlier this year, the Planning Commission approved a plan to construct three student apartments on the south side of Claflin between Highland and Knight Street. And that is phase one of hope, what they hope to be a future student housing village uh, on the opposite side of the street. So the, the parking lot that they're planning to construct at the northwest corner is to help with the current uh, parking as well as future parking for that student village. The plan that they have for the south side doesn't have any off street parking so students would need to park on the north side. So this was also considered by the planning commission at their July 6th uh, public hearing. The planning commission voted five to zero to recommend approval of the zoning change to university district. And this comes to you with options of concurring with the planning commission and approving ordinance number 211067 on first reading. You could refer this application back to the Planning Commission for reconsideration, stating your reasons for disagreeing. You could direct that this be resubmitted as a plan development district, or you could overturn the recommendation of the Planning Commission and decide that the current zoning should remain in place. If that option is chosen, use of the property would be limited to those uses allowed under the current zoning. This would not allow for the art school building or the accessory parking lot. Um, with that, I'd be open to any questions about the zoning side. Just one question regarding the buffer. The properties north of this area are still, at least on the east half, are still residential lots, it looks like from that photo. Are there any uh, additional buffer requirements when this property adjoins or butts a residential property as far as just reading through here, it doesn't look like there's a lot of requirement for. Uh, You're referring that. to the properties that are on Kerwin? Um, yeah. Uh, well, the, because the alley intervenes, there wouldn't there wouldn't be a need for a screening fence, but there would be a need um, for a, a buffer between the, the parking lot and um, yeah, I, I, I've, yeah, the plan the plan that's submitted does not. I've does seen not I, I saw the that. space there and it just didn't wasn't registering that that's an alley. Okay. Yeah. I'm, so the the yeah. that alley is actually going to be used for access for the parking lot, and then several of those properties there are owned by Kansas Wesleyan and, and they may have future plans for them other than maintaining the dwellings on the property. Any other questions for staff? I, I guess my only question would be, is the, are, is the alley going to need to have some improvements made to it if, in order to be used? and Will that be Kansas Wesleyan's responsibility, or does that look like the city's responsibility? the The city's standard on that is if you may 
use a public alley as part of your parking lot circulation, but if the parking lot is paved, then the alley portion has to be paved as well. So if there's a, if a gravel alley is used to provide access to that as part of the circulation, then they will have to pave the alley just as they do the parking lot. Thank you very much, Mr. And that, that would be Kansas Wesleyan's responsibility, not the city's. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, any questions or comments from the public? I don't see anyone's hand raised, so I will bring it back to the commission. Well, I move the commission uh, concur with the recommendation of the planning commission and approve ordinance number 2111067, changing the zoning classification of this property from R3 multifamily residence, C3 shopping center, and PC5 planned service commercial to you, University District, on first reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 21-11067. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion passes, which takes us to item 8.4. Item 8.4, approve resolution 21-7972 and set a public hearing day for the creation of a rural housing incentive district. Ms. Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Commissioners. As you may remember, we have been in a multi-step process to create an RHID district, each step creating an opportunity for you to make a decision. In May, uh, you adopted resolution 21-7955 which recognized that we saw that the district being proposed had the characteristics necessary in order to qualify it for an RHID. We took that map, your resolution, and our city's live Salina plan and shared that with Department of Commerce. They then reviewed that and acknowledged that we did in fact have the criteria necessary to create the district. From there, the process as designed and outlined in state statute requires that uh, we work through a development agreement and create a development plan for the project that would happen in that RHID district. That brings us to where we're at today. A public hearing needs to be scheduled. Um, so what you have in front of you tonight, uh, resolution 217972 asks you to schedule that public hearing. Um, at that time, staff will be back to one kind of get into the details of that development agreement, which has been attached in this packet um, you also have the development plan and the associated materials with those agreements, um, but we'll go into those in more detail. Um, with that, I will ask, we have been moving quite quickly with this project and there are some unique features. The relationship we have um, with the county as one of the taxing entities, because this is a property tax uh, increment capturing economic incentive, there's a 25 year term for this that's being requested and in the conversations we've been having with the county who does have a veto power in this process um, have asked for us along with our bond council Gilmore and Bell to look at opportunities for them to possibly use ARPA money which is the American Rescue Plan funds as some cash up front that may offset that financial impact to them through taxes over the 25 years and so in doing that we have uh, looked at the possibility of interlocal agreement light um, it's not quite as heavy as the one that needs to go to the AG, but would create an agreement that would allow for that cash. The development agreement also highlights that there's a possibility for us as the city commission, you to take cash if we had ARPA money and wanted to put into the project to do that as well. We've been kind of going back and forth and we're hoping we'd have this on last week's agenda, but ended up coming forward to this week's agenda. Um, but what we've realized is we requested the public hearing on August 30th. And that is the fifth Monday. <laughs> Our math was right. There's a very particular window. This cannot be held any sooner than 30 days and not any farther out than 70 days. So trying to get that to match up with your calendar has been a bit of a challenge. But it looks like between a fifth Monday and the holiday, that would take this item to 913. Uh, the applicant is aware of this. I'm sure not thrilled and, and we're not exactly excited about it either, but that is the way the math goes because the sixth is that Labor Day Monday and that would take us to 913. So with that, um, staff's recommendation is that you adopt resolution 217972 setting this public hearing. 
um, copies of the development agreement and all the associated materials are available in the city clerk's office for anyone wishing to view them. Uh, I believe representation of the applicant is here. And also uh, we have a representation from bond council here if you have any additional questions. And I'm available for questions. So this hearing would be set up irrespective of ARPA funds being used. Correct. And that's not the issue to be discussed then. Correct. So I guess when I am notifying you as if it's, it's a little different than a typical RHID is that we have this, we the county have this cash. And so that's part of this discussion and kind of what's held up getting the development agreement wrapped up is trying to figure out how that piece fits in. It's pretty unique. Um, but with that, my one recommendation is if you do approve the resolution as I would kindly appreciate an amendment to the resolution setting the public hearing for 913 because otherwise you won't be here. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Driscoll. Any other questions? And just to reiterate, this is just setting the public meeting date. Correct. Where we're going to take a look at all the details within the development agreement and how that's constructed. Correct. You're just setting the public hearing as required by state statute. Right. And we will notify the planning commission, we notify the school district, and we notify the county during this point too. So if, if there is an interested party that, that's aware of the public hearing and wants to see the supporting documentation, they will get the development agreement mm -hmm. and the plan. They'll, they'll have that as kind of the starting point of the conversation, but ultimate action will follow the public hearing. Will, right. the, will the action on September 13th, will that be the final action required for the RHID? It is, we will have the ordinance in front of you that creates that, but I'm looking at bond council. I think there's a 30 day window following that in which is the protest period. So essentially the county of the school district could so we come have 30 forward. days for notice and we have 30 days from. So 30 days from now you hold your public hearing. At that time, you can adopt an ordinance after holding the public hearing that would then create the RHIDs district and that process, but it's not official for another 30 days during that protest period. Following that 30 days, if you've had no issue, then it's, that's it. Then, it, then would it come back to us for second reading after the protest period then? The, the protest period starts and runs after the date of the public hearing. So the ordinance that you would consider following that public hearing would be the final governing body action of the city uh, unless it gets protested, in which case, you know, or vetoed by the school or county, in which case we'd be back to repeal that ordinance. You'd be required to repeal it because of the veto from the school or, or county. If they do not veto, then there will be, you know, you just do your regular, consider the ordinance, and then you have your second reading, and then uh, that's the final governing body action required on that process. I'm sorry, I'm Dominic Eck with Gilmore and Bell from Bond Council. I apologize for not introducing Thank you. myself. Thank you for having me. Good evening to everyone. Seems like we're, you can say we're rushing this, but <laughs> we're in October. I, I've always said if the government gets involved, it takes longer. And here we are. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you. Any, any questions Jeez. for the applicants about setting the hearing date? Okay. Any questions or comments from the public? If not, bring this back to the commission. Mayor, move approval of resolution 21-7972, setting a public hearing date of September 13, 2021 for the creation of a rural housing incentive district. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution 21-79-72. And I'm sorry, did your motion include setting the hearing date for September, September 13th. 13th? Okay, good. I couldn't. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion passes. Which takes us to other business. Is there any other business that the commission would like to discuss today? No. Okay. If not, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We'll see you here next week.